So hello everybody, uh, my name is Sai Chowdhury. I work at Qualcomm. I run product management for a, a couple of different areas. One is uh, web technologies. So obviously, that's why, why I'm here today. Um, we are going to try to do this with the Elmo. Uh, I don't know why this thing is called the Elmo. If you, anybody knows, please let me know. But uh, I thought it would be really uh, interesting to, to talk a little bit about where uh, mobile is. Now, many of you know Qualcomm, right? It's, uh, Qualcomm is a leader in wireless, 3G, 4G. By the way, I have to say that so I can expense my trip up here. I've done that now. It's captured on camera, which is good. But uh, of course, Qualcomm um, realizes this in, uh, by making the mobile processors that we now brand as Snapdragon, right? So Snapdragon processors show up in you know, smartphones, in tablets, and in the very near, near future in a lot of uh, computing devices as well. And uh, so in my world, specific to Qualcomm, you know, clearly we do a lot of things around wireless as well as you know, hardware design. But we actually do a, a tremendous amount of software as well. And this goes well above and beyond what you would typically think is the software we do when we take an operating system and then we glue it down and make it work on, on our processors. We actually do quite a bit of modifications to let's, what you might want to call middleware or even application subsystems like the browser, which is what is going to be the main purpose of today's discussion, to really take advantage of the different functional blocks on these processors. Um, in mobile, just like in digital video and other things, system on chip is not a new thing. It's been what's been there forever. So, you know, we get we talk a lot about dual cores and all this good stuff, but at the end of the day, you know, all these mobile processors in, in your smartphone, in your tablets, have a CPU, sometimes two CPUs, sometimes four CPUs, have a very, very powerful GPU, which itself is made up of inter, uh, internal processing elements. You typically have a digital signal processor, you typically have hardware decoders for video, and that's even before you start talking about the modem subsystem for wireless WAN, for Wi-Fi, for Bluetooth, what have you. So there's a heck of a lot of hardware there, and if you're not really using that hardware, you know, you get vanilla in, you get, uh, to use today's theme, poop out, right? You actually don't really get the, the great performance, the great battery life, you actually just get blah, right? And so. Um, one of the things that I like to really um, share with a lot of folks who are actually coding, you know, developers, people who use a compiler, or people who write code that actually runs through a compiler, um, the people doing the real work, hopefully many of you, um, is the fact that you know, most people think that our hard hardware manufacturers take something like Windows Phone or takes something like Android um, and actually just take it from Google or Microsoft and then do the work themselves and ship it. And that's actually quite not the true truth at all. Instead, what they do is we actually glue it down onto and, and do these different optimizations. And they actually then take most of our code and actually incorporate that into their production, uh, production custom hardware boards and designs themselves. Sometimes as a platform, you know, one design that spawns multiple, other times not as a platform. So um, why that's relevant is because a lot of what we do upstream, essentially, at Qualcomm around making web technologies and making the browsing system better ends up essentially being the source work that, that OEMs like Samsung and HTC and Motorola and um, Lenovo and Xiaomi and companies you've never even heard of ship in their devices. So it's a, it's a great return on investment for us as well as for, for our OEMs. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about you know, uh, web technologies specifically. So if you, uh, when we kicked off, kicked off and, and formed this group three years ago, it was pretty clear that there was, you know, whether it's uh, just you know, page download and, and looking at a page, um, or you know, web apps, call them HTML5 apps, that's the new, of course, buzzword now, but really HTML and JavaScript applications, that really, there's really three vectors where they were and are um, perhaps different you know, or seen as different than a na their native counterparts. You know, one was around performance, the second around capabilities, and the third around, I'll call it merchandising and monetization. You know, these are things that native apps all really have, have it down, whether you're talking about native on iOS or Android or, or, uh, or Windows Phone or even RIM. Well, I'm not gonna talk about the last, uh, about, uh, about actually you know, where, where the app stores or stores are. There's plenty of work going on there, but I'd like to spend today talking about the first two bits. 
And the first part is something that I'm not even going to show you a demo of because there's been so much talk about it in the industry and there's been so much improvement that I will actually declare that for the largest part, the first part of performance is solved. And that's around JavaScript performance. If you look at when the, the first uh, Android device launched uh, that was on uh, Qualcomm processor, we were getting JavaScript performance, um, if you run the SunSpider benchmark as an example, in the 20-second uh, millise- uh, type of time frame to run the SunSpider benchmark. Three years ago, when the first, uh, if you remember the Nexus One, that had a one gigahertz CPU core based SOC, also a Qualcomm processor, Snapdragon, um, we actually had brought that down. Really, soft, a lot of software innovations to make the JavaScript engine, which is really just a compiler that, that uses the CPU, brought that down to about 14 seconds. If you look at today, some of our latest processors, this is something called a Snapdragon S4 that's running on these developer devices that I have here. We are down, uh, whether it's in this build here or the production devices that are coming out, like the HTC One One S and One X, we are down to 1.5, 1.6 seconds. That's a 10 times increase in in that one benchmark. And you'll see the similar type of uh, uh, increase, whether it's you're running the SunSpider benchmark, the V8 benchmark uh, suite, et cetera. So JavaScript performance is something whether for the desktop or the mobile, that the, that the industry, the, the browser vendors, the, uh, um, ourselves, we're the second largest contributor to the V8, uh, benchmarking, or V8 uh, JavaScript engine code. We've really tackled and done a great job at. So um, you, know, you could actually now say, hmm, that's not going to be my performance limitation anymore. So where's the next performance limitation? And really where it is has been in the rendering pipeline. So of course, iOS has actually graphics accelerated rendering pipeline. That's great. Uh, Windows Phone is starting to get there. Android is starting to get there. What I'm going to show you is a really good example of, of what a difference that makes in your, in your HTML5 uh, application. So Android today has HT, uh, a rendering pipeline in the Android system for the parts after the browser is done to actually do GPU accelerated uh, 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 rendering and compositing. But within the browser itself, if you're actually using, for example, uh, the canvas tag, it is not hardware accelerated. So, you know, uh, GPU accelerated rendering is probably the second most commonly misused term uh, after platform, right? You know, everyone wants a platform. But um, so, but but this does make a big difference in performance. So what what I'm showing you here is we have a um, our one of our developer devices here. We call this the MTP. Um, it's not a production device. It's actually pretty fat. I just want to make sure that nobody wants to buy it. <laughs> but um, it runs our latest Snapdragon S4. And I have two builds on these two different devices. One is actually as vanilla Android 4.0, or ice cream sandwich, as possible. You know, From when we got it, we had to basically get it up and running. And then essentially the Android, uh, the latest Android uh, ice cream sandwich code base that's optimized by us that we hand to our OEMs. So. Um, that's uh, a little bit of an example of what you're seeing here. Uh, what I have also loaded is, uh, I didn't know about Wi-Fi happening here, so I lo- uh, we loaded the local pages all on the SD card. But these are uh, completely un- uh, undulterated um, websites. Many of you are probably familiar with Microsoft's IE test drive site, which has a lot of really cool, um, almost like you know, real world usable benchmarks. Here, you could look at one of the things that happens here is that you're looking at essentially a, fi- uh, a variety of fish. This is their fish tank uh, website uh, a test. And you're looking at 20 fish, and it's kind of hard to read there, so I'll read it for you here. It's 24, 25 frames per second. Now compare that. That's, that's actually Canvas. That's not hardware accelerated in the browser. Compare that to this one. And I was hoping that we could show you this at the same time, so um, that's not going to happen. But compare that to this one. This is our code that we, where we hardware accelerated the render path. You're seeing it maxing out at 60 frames per second. So here's a good example of uh, a modification that we've done essentially into the Android browser. And you know, I- I'm mentioning this to you because great, you know, you'll get this on Qualcomm-based devices that are shipping, so that's cool. But you know, you typically what we're doing about six to nine months later, either it's upstreamed into the core code base or, some, or it becomes standard into the, uh, by the browser vendors themselves, in this case, uh, Google. So this is, hopefully, this whole talk is to give you a little bit of an idea 
of what's available either today or all the way through to the fa uh, fall of this year. But you can see that not only do you get higher frames per second, you actually get smoother um, uh, running fish. Now, of course, unfortunately, with the Elmo, it's a little bit harder to see, but I'm going to try to hold it up here. I think I'm um, good with battery here as well. But I hope you can kind of see it, and you, could, you guys could come up here afterwards to see how, uh, you know, how much difference in smoothness that is. Um, another good example of this, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with GUI Mark, so let me, let me just show you that as well. Um, here again is the, the, the base system, and I'll, and I'll bring up GUI Mark. GUI Mark 3 is a HTML5 Canvas test. Um, and um, again, what you're looking at here is that with GUI Mark, you're actually seeing, you know, um, very good frames per second, regardless of which one, which one you're looking at here. But, but take a look at the, the gameplay, how stuttery it is on the base system here versus when you have optimized HTML5 canvas, look at how much smoother that is. And of course, you know, this isn't a talk just about, you know, if you're a game developer, this makes a difference. This is actually makes a difference just in standard um, swiping, scrolling, and that, that kind of uh, functionality. And so I'm going to, you know, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a view of what a big difference that, that you could make there. So that, that's one example of, of how performance as it relates to um, the, really the last vector of where HTML5 applications are really lacking versus native applications, really around both 2D and 3D rendering performance. And we, we, we believe from Qualcomm, both with the work that we're doing here that is going to be in devices this spring or uh, with essentially this kind of technique is going to be used by all the, the, um, the browser vendors you know, on phones, that this will become also, again, a checkbox, a non-issue. Let me show you something else uh, as well. So it's not just about you know, 2D. Let me, give you, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, our experience uh, of what we've had, talk about 3D. So what you're looking at here is WebGL. WebGL, and this is a, this is a very popular WebGL um, uh, web page that many of you have seen. It's called the Jellyfish web page from a, a guy named Alexander, uh, very long Russian sounding name, Al Axelrod or something. I, I can't say it, I apologize. Um, and so a little bit of history here. You know, a lot of times everyone says, you know, well, you know, HTML5 is, is uh, fine. You know, if you're making lists, you know, the, you're, you're doing the, the app store app, you're doing I don't know, many of you also probably know that the, the weather app on iOS is all, all HTML5 and JavaScript. But, you know, games, no, you, you can't do games. You can't do more complex things. There's always a need to do something native. First of all, look at that. Is there a need to do something native? I challenge that. The reason why I challenge that is we actually said those same words not even a year ago um, when we kicked off uh, what was then at the time a project with Sony Ericsson, you know, of course they're, they're Sony, to port the WebGL bindings from WebKit into Android, make sure that our driver that's sitting underneath um, is performant, make modifications to the binding, and actually that's an open source project now on, on, on a, GitHub, a GitHub project uh, that Sony Ericsson and, and we contribute to. What we found, which was really interesting, was that the native equivalent of the same application was, yes, was, ran at a higher frames per second. But frankly, unless you were a hardcore gamer, you would not notice the different sprites and things like that. So some of you may be familiar with the Android benchmark called NeoCore. NeoCore is essentially a written in Java and OpenGL ES. It's something that Qualcomm did, so we have the source code. So that's what, what we did, was we ported NeoCore over to the essential equivalents, JavaScript as well as uh, the WebGL uh, calls. And when you looked at native NeoCore, you had something like 60 frames per second on a, on a device like this. And you had the WebGL or the Web HTML5 NeoCore, you had something like 40 frames per second. And every once in a while, you'd see a sprite that's not shaded nearly as, as nicely. But frankly, for a very, very complex game-like application, you couldn't tell which one was running in the browser or not. Similar to this. I mean, we've had people come up to us at, at trade shows say, Oh, that's really cool. You've got Flash running on your, on your system. That's not Flash. That's actually WebGL. And um, so some of you may know that um, Sony Ericsson and all their Snapdragon-based devices already include WebGL. This has been there from Gingerbread. This was the work we did 
uh, collaboratively with them. And now for Ice Cream Sandwich, um, Android 4.0, we're incorporating or we're releasing WebGL to our entire customer base. So any Snapdragon-based device um, will have WebGL support. So when you talk about rendering and, and graphics capabilities that's going to be you know, at your hand, at your fingertips, um, it's not just about using Canvas. It's, you know, you'll have uh, essentially access to the GPU in, this, in, the, in the exact same uh, rich way. Um, another uh, example of fidelity, I think, is, is the, the right way to, right way to say, uh, talk about it, is, is really the, the access to more you know, uh, richer and um, more real um, fonts. So, you know, we've been limited on the desktop, unfortunately, to, uh, we've been limited, I should say, on the mobile to, you know, dealing with just kind of simple fonts that you have because all, almost all the mobile browsers, with the exception of Firefox now, um, just simply don't support rich web fonts or what's known as WAF web open font format. So, you know, why, for example, should you have this kind of a, uh, an experience when you should actually have instead um, this kind of a web experience where you have, you know, the rich fonts that you as a, as a website developer or a web app developer want to uh, portray uh, with your device. Now, obviously, uh, with your uh, content. So obviously, to have you know, this, versus this, you actually need to, of course, you know, load in and um, uh, release your fonts as part of your web app. But now, you know, you're going to be able to do that. Web open font format is something that's actually a standard in, in, in HTML5. And um, uh, what you're looking at here is the same of what I've, just like with WebGL, we're incorporating and releasing the web open font format uh, engine, essentially, as part of our standard Android builds to the OEMs so that you can have a more rich, immersive, flipboard-like experience um, on, on the devices as well. So again, trying to, you know, our goals have always been around trying to knock down all the different um, performance and, and uh, type of uh, differences between native and, and, um, native and web in order to really be able to make HTML5 a true platform, not just something that's uh, kind of limited uh, in its own way. So a lot of that was talking about kind of performance, and I would even put the fonts as a performance issue because it's really kind of a fidelity issue of you know, how, how beautiful it looks, how, how well it responds. responds. And again, JavaScript and, and rendering really kind of dominate that. But let's talk a little bit about some of the, the other parts, which has really been, that, that's been lacking, has been around capabilities. So what I mean by capabilities is you know, there are a lot of things that you can do in a native app that you just can't do in a web app historically. And I'm, I guess I'm happy to say that for the very first time in, in industry forums like W3C, there's, this is actually being tackled. Um, either, you know, working groups that have kind of been stalled, uh, or being restarted um, by companies like us or others, um, or just new working groups um, starting. So one really good example uh, of that is a web audio. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with web audio. So some of you have heard about this. So essentially, uh, one of the things that you see in the HTML audio tag um, is that essentially it's more like a DVD player interface. It doesn't really do much more than that. And so what web audio does is really extend it so that both, so you can have richer audio, not just for game developers, but you can, you know, for example, change pitch and rate and really have more of a control of your audio stream, hardware accelerated audio stream, just like you would in a native application itself. So this is a, um, a very popular app called Web Audio Drum Kit. Unfortunately, it's almost being washed out there. Um, let me, you can kind of see the controls here. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start it. And I think you can, you can kind of hear the Sorry, I don't know if you can really hear it here. It's actually pretty low. Oh, you gotta take, take my word for it to come up here. But you can see that uh, essentially what this is, essentially a drum machine. You can, um, it looks like this one's, uh, this demo's actually um, stalled right here. But with web audio, what you could do 
is um, have a more richer access to the, the audio streams and now no longer have a play, pause, fast forward, rewind, seek uh, type of uh, use case. A similar example, that something that we've been working on, um, is access to the camera. So why is it that you don't have access to the camera or camcorder in the same way that you would um, for uh, a native application? So there is no HTML5 camera tag. Uh, however, there is something in the device API working group, a camera spec API, that's essentially been stalled for a long time. So what we've done at Qualcomm is gone off and actually implemented that into our software builds um, and released that to our OEMs. And this is something you're going to start to see in the fall of this year. So um, I can go ahead and uh, take a picture. Hopefully you guys can see that. I'm just taking a picture. Actually, you know what? Let me um, delete that picture. Yes. Let me take a picture of you guys, maybe. How about that? I think, I think that's there, so you can see that, that I just take a picture. This is, again, all completely in the browser, and this is not using a media capture, which actually, you know, if many of you know, pops out, goes to the native application, you take the picture and pop back in. This is inline embedded within the browser. And one of the nice things about that is, because this actually goes down to the native camera interface, you can have all the, all the funky features that you would have um, in the native camera. So I can pick sep sepia. Again, this is where, um, oh, maybe, maybe here, how about this? I'll turn on the flash so you can see, uh, you guys can see that. Turn on the flash. If I take a shutter, you, you just saw that the flash went again. Um, and let me take another picture of you guys here. Delete. Oh, let's see here. I don't want to spend more time on, the, on that. But, you, but the key point being is that even in areas where there are stalled um, kind of specifications, you're starting to see new, new move, movement there to bring some of the, the new features that you typically would not have had in uh, HTML5 uh, back into the browser itself. So expect from Qualcomm, we're going to be releasing not only support for things like camera, but also in the very near future, uh, things like uh, web notifications, um, geofencing, um, as well as even orientation lock. I mean, how simple is that? That you know, there's some applications. If you're an app developer, you don't want necessarily the browser to be relay out, yeah, lay, uh, relay out of your app if you want it in landscape or portrait mode. Right? It's actually not just annoying. It actually gets within the within uh, the user uh, experience flow. And so simple things like orientation lock are things that we can do to build into the browsing system that we hand to our OEMs to, to make your lives easier. And so this, by, by this fall, you'll see uh, devices that actually have that, that level of support. Uh, and then finally, um, let, let me also uh, mention that this isn't only limited to uh, talking about um, you know, graphics and, and capabilities like audio and camera. Video is obviously pretty important as well, so we're, we're doing a lot to ensure that video works very well. So the Snapdragon systems are the, the first systems that actually you can, from the browser, have multiple or multi-context hardware accelerated video playing. Uh, we actually built this uh, a mock-up web page. Again, I apologize that the limo is uh, um, so, so poor here. You can kind of hear the, the sound. Uh, we are from San Diego, so we have to have surf videos, right? Of course, right? Um, but what you're looking at here is an HTML5 video playing. Um, actually, something else is, uh, some other process is running in the system, fortunately. But you can see I could pick a, a second HTML5 video. Over here is uh, uh, this carousel running all the different HTML5 videos there. And I can uh, pick one. Let me uh, wait for this one to come around here. And this is a second, second video. There we go. There we go. So it comes, comes out and it replaces uh, the first one. So what's going on here, what you're looking at, is not just multiple HTML5 videos playing back, but it's all happening essentially within the browser where it's actually accessing the hardware decoders. This is one of the reasons why you can actually have multiple, multiple ones playing. This is pretty important because over time, we know for a fact that a lot of the, the major websites are going to actually act, um, add 
multiple playback uh, support. But further to that, um, I don't know how many of you are following the, the DASH standard. It's an MPEG standard, Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. It's the first real open standard for streaming um, you know, to a client uh, using, you know, not using Flash, uh, not using Adobe's technologies, no slam against Adobe. And really, it's the sister spec to HTML5 video for adaptive streaming. And so with Dash, you'll be able to, the client will be able to pick, and, and the application in this case, you using JavaScript uh, will be able to actually request different quality video streams from the server. So it's no longer the server just telling you what, what it is, it's actually you're requesting, so it's a client-side implementation. Furthermore, it's actually adaptive in the sense of you can leave it up to the system to actually uh, request uh, the different bit rates depending on network condition and buffer bandwidth, but also you can also, in addition to that, you can actually change the bit rate yourself. So um, there's a working group called Media Elements, if you could uh, look into, uh, you can look into that itself, but Dash support uh, with multiple HTML5 video um, will be available and will be rolling out in devices later this year as well. So again, not just uh, this, you know, the, the new capabilities that we're talking about aren't really only limited to things like, no, you know, lo location or camera, et cetera, but also really extend uh, both to audio and video. Um, and so with that, let me just summarize by saying that, you know, there's a lot of different things that the industry is doing to make sure uh, that to, to really make the HTML5 brand, I guess, uh, you know, of HTML and JavaScript programming a reality in mobile. You know, a lot of what I'm showing you is specific to what we're doing at Qualcomm, what we release to our, or have released, or are releasing right now to our OEMs. So almost everything you're seeing here will be in devices by the fall. You know, essentially there is, of course, that, that lag. But really, even further to that, these are indicative, all of these kind of, um, these demos are really indicative of what is happening in the industry at large and where you know all the different performance and capabilities gaps are really being kind of plugged to really make HTML5 a reality for devices you know call it mobile or not really device kind of devices other than your traditional computer so with that um, maybe I'll open it up for any questions right so so talking about adoption of, of things like camera APIs etc so you know, uh, our approach has been to try to uh, push and pull at the same time. You know, kind of need to do both, right? So we participate in the W3C to actually get the spec uh, kind of restarted and uh, participating in this case for camera in the device working group. As you guys probably know, W3C, a spec can be in any working group. There's no rhyme or reason. Geolocation has orientation stuff in it, right? So, um, so that's one thing. Second thing, we were a founding member uh, with Facebook and others of the whole ring mark. I don't know if Many of you know about Ringmark. Please do check it out, rng.io. Um, it's essentially, the goal is to actually define a set of APIs in a set of like rings, ring 0, 1, 2, of compliancy, really, of you know, this, these browsers on these devices support this level of functionality. So things like camera might be in ring 2, a little bit further out, it's only on Qualcomm Android devices initially, and then later, you know, six months later, it's in all Android devices, and six months later, it's in Android and BlackBerry and things like that in Ring Zero. So we are actually working in that area as well. But last but not least, you know, going back to the, the real thing here, there's no, no different way to kind of jumpstart the market than actually doing the work. So we are actually doing the work to implement the code and releasing it in our software builds for OEMs to then ship with. So uh, clearly that's fragmentation in initially, but our goal is not fragmentation. The goal is to actually make it not just a standard, but it adopted across the board. So you know, coming from the device side, we actually bring a lot of experience as to what can the cameras do today and next year in the, stand, in the, you know, in the, in the processors? What can the video uh, decoders do and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're, we're tackling it from all three areas, um, W3C, Ringmark and the Facebook community working group, uh, as well as actually in our software builds that go out to our OEMs. Thank you.